Hey folks and welcome to shelf 45. We're ticking down, we're ticking, well ticking up technically I guess, ticking down to the end, ticking up to 48. It depends which way you look at it. But now we're on to a shelf with two publishers in mind. Gateway level for plan B games or next move you could even say. And a little bit of a mix of the two for lotapellet.com. I, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce this one and why it's got dot fee on the end of it. Maybe it's because it's a Scandinavian base, but as I say, uh, I'm not very good with names, unfortunately. But let's start with the big one first. Hello to nations. Nations. Now, everybody loves Through the Ages, and I admit, I like it. I like Through the Ages. I've warmed up to it. I think it's a good game. It's just the main thing I hate about it is that it can be very punishing if someone gets screwed over by war and it's far too long. I mean, like three to four hours for a game with two players is just a bit ridiculous, you know, longer than Star Wars Rebellion. But with the app, the app destroys any need to have the physical version of Through the Ages. I can't figure out why you would play the physical version when the app is just that good. I have the app. I love the I love the game on the app. I'm not very good at it, but I love it, and I would happily like to play some more games of it. But physical wise, Nations is my fruity agents because this one has a very similar feel to it. Uh, let's see if I can get it above without screwing over too much. Now there is one big flaw with the game. Yes, I know the artwork is abysmal. <laughs> it's not a very good looker. But you still have the tableau of cards that you're drafting, that you're drawing from, a bit like in Fruity Ages. And it is still a civilization game and it still has military and stability in that. But there's a few things that elevate this one. Firstly, it doesn't take three to four hours to play. I can get a three or four player game of this done in two and a half hours tops, and that does me nicely. But I like the way that you've got the buildings and the workers, like your people that you have dictate how powerful it is and what you get from it. So you can have a building that has no workers on it or you could like put a ton of workers onto one thing but then you gotta have them available for something else. I love that the uh, military track is more than just simply a war thing but I like that the stability track is a way to defend against the war. It's all right in saying, oh well, I've got more military strength than you therefore I don't suffer much losses from the war but you could also forget military strength have a really good stability rating, and it minimizes the damage from wars. So somebody could be triggering wars left and right, and you'll be like, that's okay, I've got a pretty stable civilization, I don't need to worry. It's another way of getting past the war without having to have, a, uh, you know, without having to have more war, if that makes sense. But another thing I love is the asymmetric boards, so people have got different layouts, what cards they're allowed, what leaders they can have, and this has dynasties involved. It adds a new action, which is a really cool one, but mainly it adds like a ridiculous amount of extra player boards. So now you can be everybody from Greece to China to the Huns to the Incas, I think Aztecs maybe, I don't know, the Vikings, uh, Britain I think, America, you, you can be all sorts of different nations and they all got very fundamentally different looking player boards and ways of playing them with special abilities. This is why this one, and it just feels a bit easier to teach this one in Fruity Ages. There's quite a little bit you gotta get doing and there's less admin here compared to the whole corruption mechanic. Fiddling around with the corruption in uh, Through the Ages physical is just like a bit of a pain. That's why I love the app so much. But this one just is like, this is my Through the Ages in physical form. If you prefer Fruity Ages to this, I can completely understand why. And I don't hate Fruity Ages. I used to be a bit like, mm, I don't care. But now I actually really like the game. But I would just sort of be like, here's Nations and here's Fruity Ages. Fruity Ages is just a little bit down. I would actually elevate, if I was just gonna allow an app game to be in my top 100, probably wouldn't make my top 100, but I think Fruity Ages would easily be in my top 150. Yeah, in fact, I'd be happy to say it's in my top 150. It doesn't matter if you play it in physical or app form. It's still a game at the end of the day, so it works for me. And it's not that I would say absolute no, I will not play the physical version ever, but I'd be a bit apprehensive about it. So, big old nations. Oh, put that one over there. A little bit lighter. Bicycling. <laughs> Bicycle's the game. <laughs> Flamme Rouge. Now this has got the expansion in it with a... Uh, Half decent solo mode, but I don't tend to play the expansion content that much lately. But the general game itself is just a really fun, simple cycling game. And I was thinking, I love racing games, but cycling? You're going to make me enjoy cycling? You know, I mean, I cycled to work previously, but I can't be bothered anymore. It's too much time off my hands. And 
I mean, I enjoy a bike ride, but I don't go out of my way to do it. And I don't get any interest in watching like the Tour de France or whatever they're called, you know, the, the big cycling races. They just bore me. But this game is surprisingly good fun. It's based on that whole, a bit like the Tour de France thing, where you've got two cyclists, a sprinter and a, whatever they call the other one, the pacemaker or something, I don't know. But the idea is, is that you're all, you've all got two different cyclists and you're going along the track, which can be, uh, you know, variable. And you've got two decks of cards, one for each cyclist with different speed ratings. You draw them and you decide like, okay, which one am I going to pick for each particular one? And you draw four and pick one basically. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get into a situation where you benefit off other cyclists. Because like in those races, you typically end up in a big group. And when you're in a big group, you know, something like this, for example, if you are behind another cyclist by a certain distance, you get their slipstream as a bonus. So you get to accelerate across the track for free. Whereas if you're at the front of a particular group, at the very front or in the front of another segment, you tire out and get exhaustion cards. Now, you want to have some of those because if you don't get any new cards for your deck, you will run out of cards in your deck and that would be pretty bad anyway. But... The fact that you can kind of gauge where you're going to be, try and get that free movement, and then it's all about when do you time that sprint at the end. It's like you might stay with the pack for ages, and then just before the end, or just near in the end, you're like, right, break away, go. And then you realize whether you went too early or puffed out, you know, or whether it was perfect time. This can lead to some very tense finishes in my day. And it, you know, tournaments for this go on at HandyCon often. It's just a really good, fun cycling game. And I've probably lost more games of it than I've won, but I enjoy racing games in general. It's probably one of my favorite genres. This idea that, you know, you're racing together, tense, oh, who's gonna win, who's gonna win, and yes, and then go through it. I don't know, it creates a lot of excitement in games, and the theme is usually very strong with a racing game. That is, if the racing game goes on too long, there's a different story, cough, cough, thunder rally. But, you know, most of these racing games I tend to go pretty highly for. Alrighty, let's go on to even simpler than that. Plan B or next move games. Now, they've released two games in particular that are like, oh, everybody knows these games. They're like gateway games of the century. So, but I have a difference uh, to many people as to which one is my favorite. So the second favorite of the two is Azul. And this is the only Azul I have. I do not like Stained Glass or Sintra. I am sorry, but as much as that whole timing mechanic with pushing your guy back along the windows or something is cool, the windows are just the biggest luck fest in the world. I mean, the scoring is weird in that game anyway, but in this, you have a bit of luck. You're laying out mosaic tiles and, I mean, who doesn't know us all by now if you're watching this video, but, um, you know, you're laying out the tiles on your mosaic grid, you draw them off these little, like, tiles in the middle and you put them on your board and you're trying to fill up the spots and obviously it gets tighter and tighter as you go through. Fair enough, there's some luck involved, but you can usually get by if you can't get the tile you want. With the stained glasses intro, though, you can't. If the windows on your board all want whites, or predominantly whites, and whites don't turn up, you have nothing else to do. You know, you could be aiming for a particular window and you can't do it because the tiles aren't there. Oh, great. So I'll go for this lesser tile then. Oh, but everyone else is grabbing them. Oh, right. So what now then? And it it just completely ends up as a big luck fest. I really don't like the stained glass essential one. The third one, uh, what do they call there? Summer Pavilion, I'm okay with. I like the mechanics in it better than this one. But there's a downside. I think I've done a review of it on this channel, actually. Check out the video. But as much as the mechanics are better, where you can save tiles from round to round, and you've got those bonus ones that you can grab, and you can get these little uh, segments filled out, I like it in general. It's too long, though. This is a 30 to 45 minute game when you do it all the time. Summer Pavilion can outstay its welcome and go on to over an hour, and that just gets a little bit long for a repetitive like turn sequence tile laying game especially when i could just get this out with the advanced board and have just as much of a thinky time as the other one as i say don't dislike the summer pavilion one i think it's fine but it just went on too long and that puts me off honestly my opinion if you want to get an azul just get the original the original is still i believe the best one but not the best game they've put out Everybody's like Azul is the best thing they ever did, but I personally prefer Reef. I think Reef is better than Azul. Now, 
I'm probably in the minority on this one because I think more people prefer Azul, and certainly the awards kind of say so, but I really like Reef. Reef is great. I mean, it's so colorful and pretty on the board, and it's dirt symbol. It's got practically love letter style rules for the cards. What do you do on your turn? Well, I can either draw a card or play a card. Easy. <laughs> draw a card, you draw a card. If play a card, you resolve the top bit, get those pieces. The bottom bit, you score based on where it is on here, and you're building this 3D like layout of coral tokens and that. It's uh, all these big like plastic pieces that stack. You've got to kind of plan ahead and set yourself up for big bonus scores, or you can just grab a little bit frequent and often. You know, there's two ways to play it. Turns can be super quick, because I mean, if you draw a card, you draw a card, that's it. Turn over, next. And even if you're playing at the card, it doesn't take that long to grab two pieces, put them on and then score, because there's usually a reason you did that. The thinkiness comes from trying to plan two or three turns ahead when you're thinking, well, if I play this one, that will give me the red pieces, which I can put on the board. And then if I get more red pieces from that card, I'll only score a couple of points, but then I'll have the red pieces and a big cross. And then as a result, when I play this third card, I'll get like 12 points for that one. It's stuff like that. The flaw I've had with this game though, is that I tried to teach this to my parents and they really didn't go with it. They liked Azul fine, but they just couldn't latch onto this one. And I've had that same problem with others. And it's weird because they sort of go, oh, I don't quite get what I'm doing. I don't know how to play this properly. This isn't a rocket science game though. I mean, I can understand that maybe, all right, first time playing games, it's gonna be a bit um, over the top for some people, but maybe it's that whole forward planning bit. Maybe that's just really tricky for newer gamers to get into their heads, whatever, regardless of whether it's their first game or not. But I can't see how you can struggle with this and yet manage Azul fine. It's, it's odd. But, you know, maybe people have had similar experiences, I don't know. But personally, I really love Reef, and I would play this over Azul if you put both of them on the table. But to each their own. They're both excellent games and definitely worth your money. So, yeah, that is the shelf 45. Three more to go, and the next two are entirely, I believe... Yep, they are entirely Z-Man games. Although you could argue that maybe one or two publishers jumped in in certain cases, but the ones on my shelf are Z-Man, so they are going to be Z-Man, preferably. Starting off with the lighter stuff and then moving on to the heavier stuff. So, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, stay safe, and support each other. Don't forget to subscribe.